20, Revelation 20, we're looking at the final verses here, verses 11 through 15. And again, we are reminded of what God has done. God has been a merciful and gracious God. He has extended that mercy, that grace to people in this world, and yet they have what? Rejected Him, and rebelled against Him. And as a result, they will face the final judgment. If you're able to stand, would you stand with me as we read verses 11 through 15, Revelation chapter 20. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the word of God. Lord, we realize that these are sobering verses. Lord, sometimes they're difficult to read, yea, even difficult to understand. So, Father, I pray that you will bless our study this morning. Father, I pray for any that are here this morning that may face this final judgment. God, that they would hear the message clearly. Father, that they would, Lord, find grace in your sight. Father, and escape this final judgment because of the work of your Son, Jesus Christ. So, Father, may you bless our study together. I pray that you would remind us of the responsibility that you've given to each and every one of us. Lord, and that is to take the gospel everywhere we go. And we might share it with those around us. So again, we thank you for this time. Bless our study and pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <coughs> Judgment. Oh, that's not a fun subject. It's not a topic that many people like to discuss or speak about. However, we understand that judgment is a part of God's system. But it will not be an ongoing activity of our God. There will come a time where He will bring a final judgment. And here in Revelation 20 verses 11 through 15 we, we see that judgment. Now obviously what we understand here is this, this judgment that is going to be taking place. It is, if you will, a courtroom scene. There is the, the understanding of, of a, a judge. And this judge knows exactly what has transpired. Obviously as you look at these verses, there's not a single Activity. There's not a single action. There's not a single attitude. There's not a single word that gets by our God. In our country, we are captivated by the judicial system, are we not? We, we want to know what's going on. There are, are court cases going on around the, the, the nation right now, and some of them are, are very... Um, pertinent to us, or at least in the sense that, that our ears are pricked a little bit. We want to find out what's going on. We want to find out what's going to happen to the, the individual, the, the one who was brought up on the, or in the court system. Right now we have a, a cabinet, former cabinet member of our presidents. And uh, depending on what side of the aisle a person is on, 
You know, there are people on one side of the aisle that are saying, yes, we hope that he, he is uh, uh, brought to, to justice, in, in which I believe he will be. And because of that, I hope that that brings and, and uh, tears the, the president down because how dare he bring someone like that on his cabinet and therefore he's probably guilty of something or maybe even leading to Russian collusion. And there's others on the other side of the aisle that are saying, you know, this judgment that is being brought upon Manafort has nothing to do with our president has nothing to do with Russian collusion. This is just a, a, a scare tactic. This is just something that, that is vying to, to do anything to bring the president down. And uh, what side of the aisle you're on, we don't need to discuss that here. But, uh, you know, we, we like to hear that. I remember years ago, I was at work, and uh, when uh, the... The O.J. Simpson case. Some of you have no idea who O.J. Simpson is, and uh, and the rest of us really don't care who O.J. Simpson is, right? But uh, you know, but I mean, remember the whole chase? You know, the chase, the big chase, and then all of a sudden there, you have this whole court system going on, and you know, everyone was glued to the TV, and, and, and of course, you and I, we we cast our judgment, right? I mean, okay, the the glove. I mean, come on, right? And, uh, you know, matter of fact, I, on Wednesday night in our study on the doctrine of salvation, we were dealing with the, the matter of, of God's judicial punishment regarding the matter of salvation. And when God justifies us, he declares us righteous. And uh, we, we all know that, uh, you know, O.J. Simpson was not innocent. Uh, right in whatever capacity that went to, you know, but but we we're we're captivated by this, right? I mean, there are television shows that are all about court systems, right? And and, and people love to to watch what goes on in the court and what goes on in the name of of justice. Well, here in Revelation chapter twenty, we we find this this situation taking place. Nowhere, however, is this courtroom like ours. Because in reality, there is a judge, but there are no jurors. There's a prosecutor, but there's no defense. There's a sentence, but there's no appeal. And the judgment that is going to be brought upon these people is absolutely perfect and right and final. Let's look at what John sees. Notice, first of all, the scene. The scene for this judgment that will take place. Verse 11. We're introduced to a new vision, a new scene. Verse 11 says, And I saw. What is it that John saw? I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Now, keep your place here. Go back to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, we hear Jesus speaking of this. Back in Matthew chapter 25, Beginning in verse number 31 in what's known as the Olivet Discourse, Jesus said, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another. And as a shepherd divideth the sheep from the goats, and He shall set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we be a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee, or when saw we sick and 
in prison or and came unto thee? The king shall answer and say to them, Verily I say to you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Verse 45, Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say to you, inasmuch as ye did it not, one of the least of these ye did it not, ye did it not to me, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. Revelation 20 shows us this final judgment. The scene is set. Notice what John sees regarding this scene. First of all, he sees the power. He sees the power again. This. Seen as a great, a great white throne. The word great here is the idea of, of power and authority. The one who is sitting on that throne has absolute right judgment that he is getting ready to cast. There is not a single person on this side of eternity that has absolute, perfect, final judgment. Right? I mean, there are things that you and I, we think we know, but yet we, it comes right down to it and we say, wow, I, I, was, I was wrong in that. And there are times that we have cast judgment on people or on situations and we've had to apologize for it. But this judgment is absolutely right and with great power. Meaning that those who are being judged are deserving of it. John not only sees the power, it's a great white throne, but also he sees the person. Now this is what gets interesting. Because throughout the book of Revelation we have seen one sitting on the throne. Matter of fact, we saw earlier in chapter 4 that this one sitting on the throne is the Almighty Father. And He is passing on to His Son this title deed to the earth known as the entire revelation here. However, there's an interesting concept here in this verse. It says that I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Well, who is this one that is actually doing the judging? You see, when you and I understand who God is, we understand God as a tri-unity. Right? It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is no divisiveness of this Trinity, there is no, no realm of one is greater than the other, right? We understand them in their, in their fullness, in this understanding, this, this greatness of who this God is. And we are told in John chapter 5 that Jesus and the Father are one. And we are told that the Father has given unto the Son the authority judge. Matter of fact, look over in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul is giving to Timothy an understanding of this. In 2 Timothy chapter 4. In verse number 1 it says, I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? The Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. You see, who John sees sitting here on this throne in order to bring judgment is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is the one who is righteous in his judgment. When we think of every single person that is going to face this judgment. Can you 
Just imagine the one who's doing the judging. It's the same one who died on the cross for their sins. It's a, the same one who came unto his own and his own received him not. Is it not perfect justice then for Jesus to be the one bringing the judgment? John also sees the position of this one. The position of this scene going on. It says, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. I realize that, that you and I, we're, we're sitting here and we're, we're trying to fathom this. Now remember the timeline of events that have taken place in the book of Revelation. Right? And so again, we take a pre-trib, pre-millennial position, which simply means this. Jesus Christ is the head of his church, and he is going to call them home. All who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the, in the air. Right? And so there's going to be this trump, there's going to be this shout, the voice of the archangel calling us, beckoning us, home, and so if we are still alive when, when this takes place, then you and I will not face death. And so we go up in this rapture. Then following that rapture, when the church is removed out of the way, then the Antichrist will come on the scene as, as the leader, and he will then establish this peace treaty with Israel, and seven years of tribulation will take place on the earth. And again, we've talked about the purpose of that tribulation, the, the reason why, and, and mostly it is to bring judgment upon not only Israel, but also this earth. For seven years, those tribulation days will take place in three sets or three series of judgments, right? Known as the seal, the trumpet, and the bowl or vile judgment devastation upon devastation. At the end of those seven years of tribulation, there is going to be a battle known as the Battle of Armageddon. Jesus Christ will leave the glories of heaven with His saints. That's us. He will come to this earth and He will not only defeat them at this battle or those who think they're going to battle, but there really is no battle at all. And he will defeat them with His very word. From then he will establish a thousand year reign on this earth. During those thousand years as we saw last week in the earlier part of chapter 20, there will be people who will be born to those who enter or, or entered into the millennium from the tribulation. Not you and I, we will not be having children then, but those who have gone through the tribulation, they will be able to have children. And those children will have children, and their children will have children, and there will be scores and scores, millions of people for a thousand years having children. Can you imagine the number of people? They will have children, and these children will have a choice to make just like you and I. That is to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. They are not automatically saved. There is no person whether uh, from Old Testament year, New Testament year, tribulation, or millennial days, that anyone just has an automatic pass to heaven. Every single person has to make a choice to receive or still remain rejecting Christ as their Savior. And after that thousand year reign, there will be an unloosing of Satan once again. He will gather people who will rebel against Jesus Christ once again. And then you have this judgment. Satan has now been cast into the lake of fire. The beast and the false prophet have already gone there. Satan is now cast into the lake of fire. And now you have this judgment. And what's going to take place? The ver in verse 11 it says what? From whose face, the earth and the heaven fled away. There is going to be some sort, we don't know exactly how this is going to play out, 
but there's going to be a removal of the heaven and earth as we know it. And this judgment is taking place. And Jesus Christ is judging those at this great white throne. You see, there are two judgments that Jesus Christ is going to be judging. There is the great white throne judgment that we see here, and there is the judgment seat of Christ. Paul writes about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And that judgment is for those believers during the church age. You and I will face Jesus Christ as our judge at the judgment seat of Christ, not to judge our sin, but to judge our works. But these people not only have their sins judged, but also their works. And so notice not only the scene, but then notice the summons. The summons to this judgment. In verse number 12, he says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. They've been summoned. Come, you guys who are, who are left to, to be judged, you need to come. Notice what he says here about them. First of all, the people that will be summoned to this judgment. Verse 12, I saw the dead. Those that are spiritually dead still. Those that are left in that spiritual state of deadness. Those who are small and great. It doesn't matter their status. It doesn't matter their ethnicity. It doesn't matter their financial means or whatever. You know, a lot of times people think, well, you know, hey, this is for a certain group of people. No, this is for every single person who has not been saved. I saw the dead, small and great, who are what? Or to do what? To stand before God. He continues on and he says, the sea gave up the dead, which were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead, which were in them. <coughs> and they were judged. Who, the, who are these people? They're small and great. They're men and women. They're young and old. They're Asian or African or American or whatever, doesn't matter. They're, they're rich or poor. None of these things matter. These are those who are fearful to face Jesus. Right? They, they want to just flee away in verse 11. There were many during the the judgments that fell on this earth who came to the place and said, we're, we're done with this. Would you, would you just stop? Would you just leave us alone? And you would think that as they recognized that the judgment of the things that were coming on them, they would have repented and turned and said, okay, we're sick and tired of it. We give up. We surrender. You're right. We're wrong. But instead of doing that, they continue to put their fist up to God and said, I will have none of you. One day, what? They will face his judgment. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11 reminds us that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There's not a single person who will escape this. You see, the reality is this, that we have the opportunity to confess him now or we'll definitely confess them then. Every knee and every tongue. Believers, of course, will not be a part of this. However, I don't believe that you and I, if you're a believer, will not know what's going on. I think we'll see what's going on. I believe that you and I perhaps will see our loved ones standing there. Chapter 21 follows chronologically. And in verse number 4, 
It says, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Speaking of us. What I believe is that you and I will see exactly what's happening at this judgment. And you and I may see a husband or a wife, a parent or a child, a brother or a sister, a friend, a co-worker, a neighbor, a classmate, or somebody that perhaps we had the opportunity to share the gospel with him, we didn't. We'll watch them be cast into a lake of fire with tears streaming down our face. You see, people have this idea that, hey, as soon as I go to heaven, God's going to wipe all tears. No. It's not until chapter 21. You say, but didn't we already see it? Yes, but remember, it was parenthetical. Chapter 21 is the chronological aspect of chapter 20. What is this? Why is John writing this? Why is the angel giving him this vision? Because I believe it is a call to the church to wake up and to realize this final judgment that is going to come upon people that you and I love dearly that will be cast into a lake of fire forever and ever and ever. And you and I have the answer they need. Jesus Christ. Paul shows us the people. Secondly, he shows us the place where this sun is. Verse number 12 continues on. It says, And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works in the sea. Gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. What do we see here? That every single place that they are, they will be brought to this judgment. They cannot escape it. That's the idea. You see, remember the sea. In the scriptures, you have a lot of times a reference to the sea. Remember Jonah running from God? Where did he go? He went to the sea because that's where you want. You get away from God. There is a picture here that these are people, not just literally, who are in the sea who got eaten by sharks, right? And whales. And whatever else is eating humans in the in, in the in the sea, right? No, this is a this is simply an understanding of what people who who have fought to run and hide from God. <clears throat> what is he saying? You can't. Not even death, the grave, or even hell itself. People will be what. They will be brought to this judgment. Every single person who is already dead, listen, it's not the end for them. They will be brought before this judgment. If they're unbelievers, they'll be brought to this judgment. And at this judgment, you say, what are they going to do with this judgment? They're going to confess Jesus Christ as Lord. They're going to get on their knees before Him and bow before Him. You are God. The proceedings of this summons. Again, verse number 12 says that the books were opened. Another book was opened, which was the book of life. The dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Verse 13, the end says, and they were judged every man according to their works. I believe, based upon these verses, that there are degrees of punishment. 
I believe that there are going to be people who will face a, a greater degree of punishment. I, listen, listen here's, here's, here's the bottom line. Okay, the bottom line is what? It's a lake of fire. I love how Jesus expresses it to kind of help us understand what this is all about. And he's just giving us a little glimpse of it when we read about the story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16. Right? And, and you see this rich man in hell and he's lifting up his eyes and he's looking, which I believe it is a place of consciousness. Right? I mean, don't sit there and think, okay, this is annihilation. This is not annihilation. They are not being annihilated. They are not going to a place where they will never feel anything ever again or they will never see anything ever again or they will never desire anything again. You see the story of the rich man and Lazarus and here is this rich man who is in hell. He lifts up his eyes and he says, Oh, would you please send somebody and dip their finger in water so that they can cool my tongue because I'm tormented in this place. Just because there are degrees of punishment doesn't mean that every single person in this lake of fire will not face torment. This is an incredible place. But notice what he says here. We'll talk about that place here in just a moment. But in verse number 12 and 13, he talks about these books. Verse 12, and the books were open. Two books, at least. That means this, there is a holy stenographer in heaven that is marking and writing everything that you and I are doing and saying. Think about it. Every idle thought, every idle deed, every idle word is being what? Recorded. And when you and I face Jesus Christ at the uh, judgment seat of Christ in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, don't sit there and think, hey, you know, praise God, it's going to be a great day because I'm still going to heaven. And all of a sudden, God's going to say, you know what, here are the rewards you could have had. Here are the crowns you could have had. Don't sit there and think, hey, I could care less about those things. All I care about is escaping hell. No, you won't. And these people at this judgment will also have their deeds, their words, their actions, their attitudes revealed to them. And the greatest reason for this because of their rejection of Jesus Christ. And so, John sees this scene, this great white throne, him sitting on the throne, and these people who are now being judged, who have been summoned Notice, lastly, the summation that he gives to us. He gives us this final summation, verses 14 and 15. He says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. First of all, we see the horror. Death and hell. There's Old Testament, New Testament words for this place of the departed, of Hades or Sheol. That's the idea of hell here. And others would refer to it as the, the, uh, the, the place of the, the dead, the place of the, the, uh, the abode of, of those who are rebels against God in Old Testament times. Idolatrous Israelites burned their children in the fire known as the place of Gehenna. Known as the Valley of Hinnom. It's right there along the Jerusalem. It was a place that was also known in the New Testament place as a dumping ground, a place where 
people would throw all of their, their garbage. Fires would then burn all the garbage, and it was a constant, perpetual burning that was taking place, and it would offer up foul smells that was unbelievable. It was infested with all sorts of garments. Jesus would oftentimes repeat about this, Matthew 5, verse 22, verse 29, verse 30. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28, Matthew 18 and verse 9, Matthew 23, verse 15, verse 33, Matthew, Mark chapter 9. Listen, there's, there's more spoken by Jesus Christ about hell than there is about heaven. You say, why is that? Because he doesn't want anyone to go there. It is described as fire. It is described as utter darkness. It is described as a place where the worm never dies. It's a place that is banished from the very presence of God. It is a place of unending sorrow, a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. There is nothing fun about the lake of fire. It is a place of horror. Again, why is John told about I mean, I think that there is one aspect of this where, again, all of us who see unrighteousness transpiring, and we say, God, would you, would you just bring your justice upon them? And, and, and there's elements of that in this. And so John was certainly, he was exiled. John is being persecuted for his faith, and he's exiled to the island of Patmos. Why? Because he's a, a preacher of truth, a, a preacher of righteousness, and wants to see people saved. And there's an element of John that says, God, would you just bring your justice upon these persecutors of mine? God says, John, I'm going to do it. It's also a reminder for you and for me to what reach as many people as we can with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because John not only tells us about the poor, but notice, he shows us the hope. He shows us the hope in verse number 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. What is the hope? Those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Remember the books that were opened back in verse number 12? Well, there were these books that are recording our deeds, but there's also a book where this holy stenographer is writing down your name and my name and every single other person who comes to faith in Jesus Christ. And he writes our name in that book. Jesus is now standing there. We're sitting there on his throne. And he says, I don't see your name. There will be people who will be standing, but wait, 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 stop, hold, time out, Jesus. I've done many wonderful works in your name. I've cast out devils in your name. I've preached. I've pastored.
of life. And there's only way that your name is written in the book of life, and that is with the blood of Jesus Christ. Everyone else, hold on. Uh, they'll, they'll just go, they'll just go away. They'll, they'll just cease to exist. They'll, they'll, no, no. They will be cast into a lake of fire. The reality is this. John, you're not responsible for what they do. You're only responsible for Preach the gospel. Mark says it best when he says, preach it to every creature. I mean, that's birds. And, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it's every single human being. And the, the ones that we, yeah, but man, I don't like them. Him. It was too late. 
And so a final question for us. Is your name in the Lamb's Book of Life? Or will you appear before this great white throne to be judged? The choice is yours. Well, you know, my parents, you know, they're they're good Christians. Or, or you know, I, I, I've been at church my entire life. None of those things will save you. The only thing that will save you is the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. When he died on that cross, shedding his blood, or without the remission of his sins, or without the remission of uh, or the, the blood, there is no remission of sins. It's, it's impossible for us to, to have our sins cleansed and washed and forgiven. through his bodily resurrection. My trust, my dependence, my faith in him, and my turning from that sin to my Savior is the only way of sin. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for these hard difficult and sobering passages. Father, I pray that you will help each and every person here this morning, God, including myself, to realize that the devastation of this time. Lord, this is not going to be a, a time where we are, are standing there clapping and rejoicing. Father, it's a time of Time of heaviness for the many who will be cast into an eternal lake of fire. Father, you've given us the way and the means of escape. And that is by trusting Christ as our Savior, turning from our sin. And I pray for anyone who may be here this morning without having trusted Christ as their Savior. God, may today be the day. God, may your spirit be working in their hearts right now, removing the blinders, opening their eyes to their need of salvation. God, maybe they've been coming to this church for a long time, perhaps a member, maybe even a teacher. Never come to faith in Christ, oh God. I pray that your spirit will work. Father, for those of us that are saved, I pray that you'll help us, God, to realize the brevity of life, the time is short. Father, there are loved ones that we know of that are without Christ. Oh God, would you burden our hearts? Help us to never be satisfied until we have shared the gospel with them. Or there are strangers that we'll come in contact with even today. God, perhaps you have prepared their hearts for receiving the gospel. Or it might just take a track. It might take a word. It might take simply our presence there as we witness them. God, whatever it might be, I pray that you'll use us or to proclaim this glorious good news the loss and the dying. Father, thank you for this reminder, this sobering reminder, that every single person without faith in Jesus Christ will be cast into this lake of fire, never to escape. Burn this into our hearts. We pray and ask in Jesus' name.